Hi, everybody. Welcome to Humane Voices, the official podcast of the Humane Society of the United States. I'm Carrie. I'm here with Kelly. Kelly, welcome back. Uh, and today we are talking about biases against certain dog breeds and how those biases can break up families. Um, these are reg uh, regulations that we frequently refer to. I, I think we have a bad habit in the animal protection world of sometimes just referring to something called BSL, which is one of those um, mystical acronyms that we sometimes drop into conversation. But what BSL stands for is breed specific legislation. And today we have someone who's uh, one of our experts on this, uh, Jessica Simpson, the Senior Specialist for Public Policy in the Companion Animals section of the HSUS. <laughs> Jessica, welcome. We're excited to talk to you about this. Thank you. Excited to be here. Yeah, thanks for being with us, Jessica. And I, I got to tell you, uh, pod listeners, I'm very excited to have Jessica on today's episode because I get to work with her every day. So I can attest to what Carrie said that we do have a subject matter expert with us uh, to dig deep into this BSL issue. So let's start with that. Jessica, what, uh, tell us what BSL really means. Yeah, happy to answer that. So BSL or breed specific legislation, sometimes referred to BSD, breed specific discrimination, it mm -hmm. means the same thing. Um, it's really any law or regulation that imposes limitations on the ownership of a dog um, based on their appearance or their perceived breed. Yeah, and just to be clear, I mean, there uh, they, we, we talk about BSD, we talk about BSL, but sometimes we we're, we can be talking about either laws or sometimes we're talking about sort of private policies, right? Because a lot of this plays out in in home ownership and apartment rental situations where where certain dog breeds are targeted as you can you can have a dog, but you cannot have this kind of dog, even though this kind of dog is perfectly nice, right? Exactly. And so um, we've seen that in municipalities when they have decided to roll back those types of legislation or ordinances where it it says that, you know, the, the area has determined that this is not an effective way to manage dogs in the community or mm -hmm. increase public safety. Unfortunately, because that's a, you know, a private policy when it's seen in um, apartment complexes or in the insurance space, um, the the city saying that other uh, entities are not able to discriminate on dogs based on their breed, that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to impact those types of private policies. So even in places where um, BSL has been rescinded, it still affects families. And um, mm. that's one of the reasons why uh, education is so important. I mean, maybe you could talk a little bit, Jessica, about how this kind of policy can affect communities. I mean, it's it's the family dog. I mean, it's 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 an effect on the animal, but the people too. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so we know in the United States, there's been multiple surveys done, kind of census uh, taking a census on how many families, how many households have dogs. Um, it's estimated that about 90 million U.S. households have dogs right now. Um, about 69 of those 90 million are dog owners and nearly half are mixed dog breeds. So um, it's important to understand sort of how it's enforced um, because that's usually where we see the most negative consequences. Um, usually when it's enforced, it's done through something we call visual identification. Mm -hmm. And the problem with that is because pit bull, as we've been saying, um, or breed specific legislation, which is typically affecting pit bulls or pit bull type dogs, is this sort of catch all term. It doesn't um, refer to one specific breed. It typically refers to a number of different breeds, um, including the American Pit Bull Terrier, the American Staffordshire Terrier, the Staffordshire Bull Terrier, and the American Bully. Those are usually what we see. Um, and it's almost like if you compared uh, sort of retriever as a as a breed. So there's if we were lumping in golden retrievers and Labrador retrievers and flat coat retrievers. So you can see there are differences between those mm -hmm. types of breeds. And so it's um, kind of muddies the water when we're trying to use um, just our eyes to to make determinations as to whether or not a family is able to keep a dog. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's I mean that's what we're talking about. And you had said when you were describing what BSL is, Jess, that. To be clear for listeners that it is based solely on appearance, right? Whether it's someone can't rent an apartment or get insurance or they live in a city or a town that has some type of BSL that they can't even own that dog solely because of its appearance, even if it has no history of any type of bite or any, you know, any, any negative interaction with another animal or human, but because of their appearance, 
they are not permitted in that space. That's correct. So unfortunately, over the years, we've seen the term pit bull sort of twisted into a lot of different variations. But because it's so subjective, usually what that means for most people is sort of this medium sized dog. It might be particularly muscular. It likely has a smooth coat and it likely has a blocky head. And so um, a blocky there are, head. Yep. <laughs> yeah, a blocky head. And there are a number That's of an official breed, that, right? Yeah. Blocky, head. blocky headed, whatever. AKC right? registered yeah. blocky head. Yeah. Exactly. And and what's you know alarming and the fact that we use visual identification to um to make the determination about breed specific legislation and, and where um that applies to certain people and where it doesn't, um, is that even animal professionals, so veterinarians, animal welfare people, animal control officers, people who uh, deal with animals and dogs in particular on a regular basis uh, are more likely than not able to identify those dogs based on their, their breed. One study, the, a group of animal professionals was able to identify successfully about 25% of the dogs that they looked at. So that was out of 120 dogs. And the only way that they were really able to tell is if the dog had more than 50% um, one breed or another. Mm -hmm. And what we know about mixed dogs is typically it's not just two breeds that are in there. So one is not going to be, it's unlikely that one is just 50%. Mm -hmm. There's often 20%, 30%, 27%. And so it makes trying to, to implement and enforce these kinds of laws particularly difficult. So it's difficult then for the law enforcement community, um, and I would assume, therefore, probably we find sometimes support um, from animal control or law enforcement on that. Um, what are, I mean, I would guess other people, you know, oppose BSL, other groups. I mean, we probably are not the only ones that um, do not support BSL. Is that correct? Yeah, it's definitely not just animal welfare organizations. Um, experts in policymaking, scientists, government agencies all have come to the same uh, agreement that breed specific legislation and using singular factors to determine whether or not a dog is more likely to bite or cause damage um, does not increase public safety. So uh, organizations like the American Bar Association, the National Animal Control Association, um, Centers for D Disease Control, um, our DOJ or Department of Justice and the, the U.S. Department of Housing have all agreed that this is not the, the best way to manage public safety. I mean, it, to me, it's always BSL has always seemed sort of fundamentally anti-American. I mean, you know, like if we're talking about we live in a country where you're innocent until proven guilty, these dogs are ba basically facing the opposite of that, right? Like a whole bunch of these dogs being targeted for appearance. I remember when we wrote about this a while ago for uh, for Animal Sheltering, which is now Humane Pro, one of the things we discovered is, you know, a whole bunch of dogs that you would, at a glance, you would be like, oh yeah, that's a pit bull. And when you actually do a DNA test on that dog, you know, there's hardly any of those, those four breeds that are supposedly pit bulls in that dog. It's just, you happen to get a combination that looked like one. That's right. Um, and, and breed specific legislation extends far beyond the pit bull. It, it usually mm -hmm. encompasses a number of different dogs. Um, and it's all sort of based on a lot of fear of, of this, um, unfortunate when, you know, a, a feeling of betrayal, when a dog, um, bites a person, there's, there's this sense that, and I, and I think throughout our country, a lot of people feel like dog is man's best friend. And so when a negative incident happens, we have sort of this really strong reaction to the, the betrayal that is felt there that isn't necessarily true, obviously, like there are multiple factors, that contribute to dog bite incidences. And usually it's it's a number of different things, none of which have anything to do with breed. It's things like the ability for someone else to intervene, the size of the person, um, the, the environment in which the dog was raised and where it's kept. So things like that are, are usually what contribute to dog bite incidences. It's not necessarily the breed. When do you think we, at times there have been, you know, when there is an attack or even certain things in, um, you know, maybe the entertainment industry, there's been some hysteria created maybe around this that plays into that as well? Yeah. Um, like I said, I think it's because of our sort of unique connection to canines that we see that. Um, the 
the media portrays uh, sort of, you know, we know that clickbait is a thing and the most horrific things are often broadcast across, you know, news platforms more frequently. Um, one of the the problems with sort of them assuming that more broadly, pit bull type dogs are the um, the perpetrators of these types of attacks is because we don't know how many dogs live in our various communities. So when we only have part of that equation, it's really impossible to figure out who exactly or which dogs exactly are more likely to cause harm. So it's fairly arbitrary then. I mean, I guess it's back to the appearance that it's just a, we've decided this dog is the dog that we're going to build policy around. And 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 let's talk about that. We we talked about private, maybe a private apartment complex and municipalities. I mean, are there cities and states or federally that, um, you know, use BSL or that have BSL in the books? Is it all of them? Um, well, so decades of work, there are no states left with um, a statewide breed ban. However, we do see them in municipalities across the country still. So um, I live in one. Yep. Do you? Yeah, I do. And I, I, I see like I regularly out walking my tiny little dog and our beagle and I see my neighbors frequently walking their pit bulls after dark. And I'm, I'm just like, it, it really kind of kills me thinking that I can go out for a pleasant stroll with my dog and just enjoy that moment of bonding with my dog and are my neighbors are out there. And sometimes I'm like, well, they're clearly walking this dog after dark to make sure that they're not seen and per- perhaps challenged about the breed of their dog. The criminals that they are yeah. like shrouded yeah. in the alleys. Right. Yeah. It's just really depressing. Dog. Yeah. It's, it's true. And, and that's like, that's a great point is the, you know, the harm that this causes our communities, this type mm-hmm. of legislation, it's, it's a resource drain. Um, it's been proven in city after city where it's been implemented and in various countries, n- n- a number of them have done studies that prove that it's ineffective and it's expensive. And so it wastes really finite resources. It inundates either the shelters in those communities or the shelters surrounding those communities as people have to decide whether or not to stay in them or leave or mm-hmm. give up their pet or have to have to sort of live in secret with their pet and fear that um someday it may be enforced, this BSL, and they have to decide whether or not they want to stay. Um, a, a terrible case happened in, in Iowa this past year where um, there were about 10 families that suddenly were issued warnings that they had pit bull type dogs, they were not permitted in that area, and they had 10 days to find new homes or remove the dog. A few, I think, move out, but that's not uh, that's not possible for every person to sell their home in 10 days or to find a new place to live and to have to decide whether or not you keep your family dog who, in, in the case of these dogs, had done nothing to provoke, you know, this kind of um, attention or or leave your community. And um, that's heartbreaking. And it really it shouldn't be the way that we're managing dogs um, in our communities, it's not a good way to build rapport with your law enforcement, with your animal service providers. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, study after study have found that it costs usually the city millions of dollars and either lost revenue from people moving there or moving out, lost jobs in um, the grooming spaces, in the pet supply spaces, um, in the veterinary spaces. So it causes harm um, sort of in this domino effect. And it's it's really tragic. Well, and I and you hit upon all of the the negative consequences, and I think it's important to, uh, as you did with the example in Iowa with those ten families. I mean, for folks to understand, that's ultimately what we're talking about. You can have a family with children in that family that have grown up with that family dog, mm-hmm. and then being asked to get rid of the dog, you know, or if you don't have the financial resources, to, as you said, to move or to make a different plan. I mean, that that is the breaking families apart that we're talking about. You mentioned, Jess, that uh, there are no states now that have this, which obviously there were at some time. So I think there's, um, you know, this is something that may we'll look back on and say, oh, gosh, I can't believe we once did that or these existed. So we have states that don't have them now, obviously municipalities that do. But 
Can you talk a little bit about how even uh, some industries have started to move away from BSL? I know, Jess, that you've worked uh, with the insurance industry and working in that space, and there's now some policy around that. I think that's um, interesting for folks to know that even just homeownership, uh, BSL plays into that, but that we're seeing some change there slowly. Yes. Yeah, so... Um, often we think about BSL in, in respect to how people secure home housing, uh, as we said, in apartment complexes, we often see it or municipalities um, more broadly, um, but it does extend to people's ability to even um, get mortgages or live in certain homeowners associations because of policies that they'll impose. And so what we've been working along with um, the industry and with um, other um, organizations in this space um, is is overturning the ability for for insurance industries to be able to deny, cancel, non renew, um, or increase premiums on policyholders in both the homeowners and renter space um, based solely on their breed of dog or based on the breed of the dog um, in that space. And so, um, the, historically, the industry has been allowed to sort of impose these really unfair and exclusionary policies um, in a way that they don't usually handle um, underwriting. So typically, it's required that they they use uh, you know actuarial data and and really substantial information in order to make determinations about risk. Um, however, because the industry sort of operated in this space for so long, and I think there just hasn't been enough of an understanding from consumers and from um, from the industry itself about how you know dog bites impact uh, human health and um, their prevalence throughout the country. They've sort of just arbitrarily blanket had exclusion policies, um, many of them. And so what we're hoping to do in a lot of these states where, where legislation's been introduced is, is change that and ask them to instead look at the deed of, of what the dog has done and, and use data that is not subjective, but objective in order to determine risk like they do with um, with other risks that they underwrite for. Yeah, because you could have a family that is moving to, let's say, an apartment complex. They Maybe this complex permits them to have their, um, you know, a, a pit bull type dog and but yet the complex requires them to have renter's insurance, but they can't get a policy mm -hmm. because it is exclusionary. So there's, you know, so many barriers that are put in front of families uh, or individuals uh, when BSL is in play. But it sounds like there is, you know, there's some forward movement um, from uh, policymakers, from the industry. And is that just... I would imagine, I mean, obviously the work certainly HSUS is doing on that and other organizations, but a groundswell of just dog owners. Yeah. And, and you know, we are encouraging because um, I think prior to my working on, on this issue, I had no idea about my rights as a consumer in the insurance mm -hmm. space. And a lot of people don't know that um, there are, you know, insurance commissioners in every state that are there to protect your uh, rights and your ability to obtain insurance um, in a fair and equitable way. And so if you are a person who hasn't been able to secure insurance, I encourage you to write to your commissioner. You can Google who it is in your state and let them know that you are facing this barrier because of the breed of dog that you have. Um, in our work, we've heard from a number of them that they didn't know that this was an issue because they've never heard from their constituents that it was. Mm -hmm. And so um, it's it's a pretty in the weeds issue, which is why I think a lot of people don't, don't know. Um, I certainly didn't. Um, but uh, for example, my mom, uh, she was looking for insurance and never had an issue or a claim and, and called a number of companies and was unable to find because she had a pit bull type dog. And um, I, I think there's a lot of barriers to, to finding this stuff and finding out information um, if you're sort of an uninformed person, which is the average person. Not a lot mm -hmm. of people know much about uh, insurance underwriting, I would I would. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just as a little light reading in your spare time. <laughs> yeah. I just love to read about insurance underwriting. Yeah. 
So just out of curiosity, I mean, one of the things that I was thinking about, you know, I know we're talking a lot about pit bulls now, but in terms of the arbitrariness, I mean, when I was a kid, I'm probably dating myself now, but I, I, I remember I our neighbors had a really sweet Doberman Pinscher. And at the time, there was this very this sort of like, I was, I think, three-ish, and there was this real nervousness about, do we let the do we let the child play with the vicious Doberman Pinscher? This is the dog that I once took an entire Easter cake and coated the dog in Easter cake frosting. Um, it was the happiest dog day of the dog's life. But Don't try I mean, that at home, kids. Yeah, I definitely. I, I do not recommend experts perform that. Um, but it just, you know, like, I, I feel like that this is a cyclical thing, but I feel like pit bulls have been targeted for a good long time now. Yeah, it it definitely seems to kind of ebb and flow over Mm -hmm. the years, which dogs are sort of the has the spotlight on them for the scariest kind of dog and the most dangerous. And um, and I think that changes in part just, you know, with time and with Mm -hmm. popularity of various breeds. But I will say that, like, over the years, um, I think you're right, Pipples have been um, at the crux of this issue and. it's been interesting because our media has depicted them differently. So for the better part of their existence, they did have widespread popularity in in movies with celebrities, um, with a variety of ages and races and classes of Mm -hmm. people. Um, Early on, they were really marketed as very easygoing and and fussy tolerant pets, which is what sort of made them so popular a long time ago. Mm -hmm. Um, Also, you know, they starred in movies and sort of were, America's dog. That's how they were classified. Um, they were um, appeared as courageous and really resilient in a lot of novels. And um, they had this really, um, you know, great American spirit in them is, mm-hmm. is how they were portrayed. And everyone's heard myths about the nanny dog. They're very patient and friendly dogs often. And so with children, especially. And so I mean, myths are are born out of all types of things. And we, you know, see those across you know, across various breeds about um, stereotypes about about how how they behave and how they should behave. Right. And I mean, the thing is that I think just as we talk about the mythology here, but it, it's like, I think we, we would want to sort of combat the mythology about um, any sort of breed as a whole, right? Because it's all about the individual animal. I mean, just as sort of like the nanny dog was probably not a fully realistic idea of what any breed of dog is, the idea that there's some sort of like demonic like overall breed is also unrealistic. And it's all about these, these, these animals are individual animals and we need to treat them as such. Yeah. It's often what we've done. I mean, when we look at kind of black cats, Right, what's right. been done. I mean, it's yeah. kind of the same, you know, same hysteria. And it flies in the face of anyone that's ever been around dogs, uh, pit bull type or other dogs. I mean, I have one of my best friends uh, has a Bichon and I got to tell you, I mean, the, how she's gotten insurance coverage for that dog, I'll never know because that dog is a killer. <laughs> I have a chihuahua and my ankles will never oh, be the same. You know. I swear. Yeah, no, yeah, it's ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's right. And that's why um, we think it's better to look at really breed neutral laws and, and mm-hmm. look at the, the ways that we can um, create safety in our communities, because that's in theory what BSL was born from, you know, public safety concerns and um, knowing now from the science and the there's there's no nothing that really supports that um, these types of dogs are more uh, likely to cause harm, have a higher propensity to bite, anything like that. It's better to to use breed neutral laws that are going to be applied equitably and um, that way communities will be safer. So how do we, for listeners that think, oh, I didn't know about this or now I'm really ticked off and I want to fight for these dogs or for folks that have pit bull type dogs or other blockies, um, they want to get involved and kind of engaged on this issue um, because I do think people are slowly becoming more aware of it. What can they do? Yeah, I first recommend, since this is generally at the municipal level, to engage locally. Um, figure out if you live in a place that has, you know, BSL um, or there are policies that you're aware of, you know, figure out what kind of messaging is really going to work and and 
talk about, are they a waste of taxpayer dollars? Is it a bad use of resources? Talk about how ineffective they are at increasing public safety, um, how outdated they are and they should be repealed. There's lots of ways to um, frame these discussions depending on who you're interested in speaking with. For policymakers, it's, you know, there's gonna be different um, talking points versus talking to your apartment complex or your insurance um, agent. And, you know, finding a diverse sort of coalition of people and working um, a, among them in order to show sort of elected officials and otherwise um, that a significant portion of your community supports overturning these, mm -hmm. these types of laws is going to be the most effective. You know, talk to your veterinary professionals, your animal control and enforcement agencies, um, shelters, rescues, families who've been impacted. Um, those are, are great voices to include in, in your message. Um, and also, you know, bring it home. Talk about how this has hurt people in your community and really do some storytelling to, 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 to make how much these policies affect, how, make them real, how mm -hmm. these policies affect um, uh, families in your community. And if you're like next level ticked off, um, and you're like, I'm going from, I have a dog and I want to get insurance coverage, or I'll talk to my council person, but you're next level. You're like ready for activism, um, you know, to be the voice for blockheads. What's a good resource? So we have, um, stuff online. We've got great toolkits. We've got talking points. We've got so many resources on our website. Uh, you can visit humanepro.org slash topics slash BSL to find uh, toolkits and other resources, articles. Um, we've got talking points. We've got letters to the editors, uh, sample um, drafts, and we have other advocate um, information that can really help you drive home this point in your community. So Jessica, in terms of one of the ways that um, that this can impact communities, I mean, I would imagine that, you know, we're, there's a lot in the culture right now where people are rethinking how how we police communities, how how police interact with with local communities, with their neighbors and and sort of trying to sort of rethink think that. I mean, one thing that strikes me about this issue is that if we're sort of setting setting up people to have their dogs taken from them for no reason other than breed, it it's going to put uh, animal control and the police in a difficult situation and confrontational one right off the bat. That's right. And uh, one of the challenges is the enforcement mechanism. That's often where law enforcement finds um, one of their greatest barriers. And, and it really does so distrust in a community when um, the goal of many law enforcement agencies, especially ones where animal control and law enforcement really overlap, which is if in effect, many mm -hmm. communities, especially smaller, more rural communities, um, it doesn't build positive relationships. It can cause um, a lot of friction. It's very difficult to enforce. It's costly because often people um, want to fight those uh, labels, and especially if it means having to rehome or um or find a new home for yourself, rehome your pet, or find a new home for yourself. And so that goes through the courts and it's expensive mm -hmm. for the city. Um, and we've we've heard from law enforcement in the past that it's it's not it's not a positive way to interact with their communities. And um I mean, imagine the officers in Iowa in that case you talked about that just oh happened, Jess. I mean, talk about drawing the short straw. They had There's to, a lot of finger pointing, I'll say. Right. That. <laughs> I mean, they, they signed up to protect and serve and, you know, be there for the community. And they had to spend their day going to remove family dogs who were yeah, not a problem. Informing, exactly. Yeah. Informing yeah. families that they're no longer that they're in violation of of a county or city ordinance that, um, you know, they're going to have to to remove a member of their family. And a lot of, um, you know, a lot of these breed specific ordinances or, or policies also include dogs that law enforcement regularly utilizes. Mm -hmm. um, German shepherds mm -hmm. and often pit bulls are, are type dogs are getting used more and more in those spaces. And, and when military folks retire, we see that there's barriers for veterans with these kinds of um, pets who often um, can't access different kinds of services or housing because mm. they're companion and, and sometimes they're um, sometimes they're you know emotional support animals or service animals 
but for a variety of reasons, they aren't able to get the paperwork or the um, landlord or property agency is, is making it difficult for them to, to work with them in order to keep their pet. And it, you know, because it's such a sticky situation um, for, for folks, it makes, it makes it really difficult and um, definitely contributes to overcrowding in shelters. Often we see, you know, uh, the dogs on these breed ban lists or just large dogs in general in shelters and they're hard to move. And that's because of policies that prohibit them. Mm -hmm. Which is an awful uh, life for the dogs by no fault of their own or yeah. cramming shelters to capacity. But it also is a financial drain on the community that in municipal shelters, they are you know, pain for that, literally. Right. So for just... a dog that could have just been home happy with its family. Yes. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah. All right. Well, Jessica, thank you so much for being here today, for telling us a little bit more about this issue, which is probably in a community near you, but uh, hopefully with, with some more work and more community support and citizen action, we can uh, keep that from being the case. Um, listeners, thanks so much for being here today, and we will see you on the next time on uh, Humane Voices. Humane Voices.